praise Jesus. We have uh, Sister Kim Hilton on the phone. I see you there in the call dock. Uh, let's go ahead and bring her live. Praise God. What a blessing. Here we go. <laughs> Praise Jesus, hallelujah. Sister Kim, are you there? I am. Oh, what a what a blessing to have you join us tonight. God bless you. We uh we got uh people had notified us and sent in emails and such and they had heard your testimony on True News and said, Oh oh, oh, you gotta get this lady to come on and tell uh the people what the Lord is showing her and uh we're just so happy that you were able to join us. God bless you. Well, thank you for the invitation. I have I've uh, been praying about this, and we've had this date set for some time, and I'm glad to be here with you tonight. I've, I've really looked forward to it and been praying heavily this evening. Praise God. And um, and and the way we, we uh, work this for, for guests, we're a little bit different than some of the other programs that you may have um, uh, uh, part, you know, you know, joined up with or whatever uh, or interviewed with. We, we kind of just – hand the microphone over to the guest and let them share, you know, un- unless you want to, you know, go back and forth, we're, we're here for you if you do want to do that. But um, we generally will just, you know, kind of pass you the mic and say, let let the Holy Spirit lead and share with people as you, as you are led. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I was honestly expecting you to um, be talking with me, so – Certainly feel free to interject and talk with me. I have been, you know, first of all, you have asked me to share the prophetic word I received back in August, and I will do that. But I felt really led to to talk about a couple of other areas. Um, I think most people, especially with your program, are well aware of what is going on around the world and here in the United States and have been hearing different prophetic words, prophetic warnings, even prophetic words with certain dates, and dates have not happened, or a certain time frame has not happened, which has created um, some doubt and some questions, maybe even some mockery and laughter about it. And and me too, because, you know, God has not given, given me specific dates, although he's giving, given me very clear words um, that are from him and a warning to God's people. And so as I've been searching and praying myself, trying to understand where that balance is with uh, what we're hearing and seeing, but yet um, something didn't happen exactly when um, a certain person shared and, and put that out and was blasted and heard by, by thousands upon thousands of people. And so I've been asking God about this, and I've just – I've been like, Lord, you know, what is this when, you know, we we feel pretty certain that a person is chosen by God and is a prophet and is sharing um, these warnings and um, says some dates, and then guess what? That date didn't happen. And so this is a little bit of what I want to share. Um, I think that's what I want to do first. I'm going to share some of the explanation that God has given me, and then I will share the prophetic word that I received, which which is quite lengthy. So let me give some explanation first. All of what we do is based on faith, every bit of it. Very few people have visually seen Jesus, whether it be through a dream or where they were awake and it was a vision or even a a one-on-one encounter. Um, we we live a lot by faith, even in, in the physical world. You know, I've never met Abraham Lincoln. I believe the picture that I see in books is of him. And so we, we live quite a bit by faith in the physical world, in the natural world. So here we are in the spiritual world. And we have chosen to believe in a God that created us. We've chosen to believe of his son, and we've chosen all this entire Christian walk. But somewhere in this journey, we have shifted away from faith. And sometime back, and it's in my book, Closet Words, um, in my journal that ended up being um, turned into a book called Closet Words. But I'm going to share what God told me some time ago, the definition of faith, in, in, in a word to me. 
This was day nine of a fast. To have faith is not a journey for the weak. Faith is walking in darkness, but seeing only light. I am the light in the darkness. I am your guide telling you which way to go. To persevere in the darkness is great achievement. I am with you in your lonely times. I am with you in the unknown. Refresh yourself and know that the Lord your God is with you and will not forsake you. I hear your prayers and I see your needs. You are not without provision. I will strengthen you and you will see your God is able to do all things for you. Do not grow weary in your suffering. You will find me in the midst of your difficulties. I am the God of miracles. Do not waver. Stay strong and true to know to, to do what you know is right. We have made a choice in this Christian walk to believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. We've made a choice to believe that Jesus walked this earth and died for us. But somewhere in the actual application of our faith, things have shifted. And you see, when we go to church service and when we sing, when we read our Bible, when we raise our hands, when we pray, all of that is knowledge. Because what happens is we are able to see it. We're able to know this, but it becomes faith when the lights go out. It becomes faith when you don't have that and you have to apply it and you have to use it. So right now that I have this in front of me or I can discuss this with you, that's knowledge. Faith is when it's all gone and I have to believe in every bit of what I have been doing all of these years. So here we are at this time and this crossroads that the earth, the world, everything is rumbling and noises and and prophecies and wars and rumors of wars and everything is pointing in a direction that it's obvious that Christians are taking notice. So back to the question, what's going on and how come certain things haven't happened at certain dates? So this is where I'm going to start with what God has given me this evening to share. First of all, I'm going to ask this question that I've given recently to people. Did Noah, when God told him to build an ark? First of all, you have to understand there was not even rain before then. So there, it's not like we can look outside and, so, and you see the clouds and they're a little bit funny looking and there's some mist and even you can even smell it and you feel it against your cheek. It's going to rain. But you have to understand, with Noah, there had never been rain. So he was told something was going to happen that had never happened before. But he was told to build an ark. He was told to make the provisions, and he had to do quite a bit. If you think about all of the food, all of the furniture, everything that went on for the family, for the animals, and how long that took. So this is my question. Did Did Noah say God would provide for him? Or did Noah obey, knowing God would protect him? So I was reading today, and this is what God has led me to share. If you read in Hebrews, Hebrews 11, they call it the big, the great hall, hall of faith. And I have all of the different people circled in my chapter. My Bible's written quite a bit in. And I was reading this, and if you just go down by this, by faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice. Well, that's something they knew about. They knew about sacrifices. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life. By faith, Abraham was told to go to a different place. Of course, he could see the land. He walked around. All of these different people. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons. By faith, Joseph, when the end was near, spoke of the Exodus. By faith, Moses, his parents hid them in the three months in the bushes. By faith, Moses, when he grew up, refused to be known as Pharaoh's daughter, as the son of the Pharaoh's daughter. Um, by faith, the people passed through the Red Sea. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, the prostitute Rahab. By faith, by faith, on and on it goes. But the part here, by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became the heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. But he had not even seen this. None of that had happened. 
nothing, none, none of what he had been told, but he had to completely, through obedience, say, I will obey God knowing God will protect me. He didn't sit back and say, oh, well, God's going to take care of me. He's just going to provide for me. It was obedience through his faith. So at the end of this chapter, <clears throat> it says right here, in the case, it ends in sort of at 31, each of the different people, by verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute, Rahab, because she had welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient or unbelieving. So this whole chapter, all of these different people, the great um, hall of faith, and this is what happens here. What more shall I say? I don't have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, uh, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouth of lions, quenched, quenched the furry of fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, who became powerful in battle and routed for foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes of the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned them, had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. That means that many, many things they did not even actually see, but they chose to obey through obedience. And so many people are hearing different things that are going on or prophecies and they're saying, well, huh, how come it hasn't happened yet? Well, everybody says to get ready, but, it, you know, nothing's going on. Ha, ha, ha. Well, let me tell you, we don't know the exact time. We can know the season. We, we can estimate that we ourselves are not God. But I can tell you through what God has told me, just a simple woman, um, we have a farm. I don't have a huge ministry. I don't have a huge amount of money in the bank in this massive ministry where everybody knows me. But what I do know is what God has told me, and he's made it very, very clear, and it took 48 hours for me to write it down. It's in four parts. It, the first part is to the church. The second is to God's people. The third is to those who stand in the pulpit. And the last part is to those who claim to be in the ministry which really covers the entire Christian walk as a whole. Someone in the Christian uh, world will receive this word, and it's a huge warning of what is coming and what is happening. And so with that, do you have any questions before I share any more? No, no questions, but I will say <laughs> I um Many of the listeners are probably thinking that we got together with you and choreographed that what you just said because, believe it or not, the word that the Lord gave you about faith and the reading that you did from, from Hebrews, we actually said that exact same thing in the first part of the show. Uh, oh, you're uh, kidding. We, I'm kidding you not. Uh, praise Jesus. Listen to this. I'm not going to reread it, but I will uh, show you the reference. Uh, in, uh, you know, almost every show we do a reading from a Smith Wigglesworth devotional. Mm -hmm. And um, in, uh, uh, in the first part of the show, within the first uh, 30 minutes of the show, we read the excerpt from Smith Wigglesworth's devotional for this particular day, uh, December the 30th, in his book. And it starts out, quote, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, uh. Hebrew 11, four. by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did no. not see death, verse 5. I, literally, I mean, your word that you were given for this show tonight by the Lord was Almost verbatim read by, uh, I know, I said to Kenneth, I was sending him a text message, Kenneth is the co-host, Kenneth, say hello to Sister Kim. Wow. <laughs> hey, Sister Kim, yeah, it was a, it was a real, uh, 
This is a real supernatural. I, I love it when God does this. Um, he kind of confirms well, these things through two or more no. witnesses. So I'll say you have to be the third witness now. <laughs> so this is wonderful. Mm-hmm. This is what Paul talks about. You know, he mm-hmm. says that it'll be confirmed by two or three witnesses, and you're the third witness. Well, it's it's encouraging to me because, you know, I too share with others that, you know, if I receive a word for a person and it's something new to them, I always say just, just pray and, and God will confirm it. Either you already are sensing it and I'm confirming it or another person will come and confirm it. But But just to share, just as human as we all are, I have been preparing for this today, and of course, uh, we have a large, we have six children, we have a farm, I'm very busy, and um, as I was watching the clock, I was praying, and I just, I almost felt, and I think many people in situations like this, I felt so inadequate, and I was like, God, you know, what is it that you're wanting me to share, just just give me the words, and I have just a couple of notes, and I was like, wow, you know, this is 90 minutes that I've been asked to, to basically help fill in a time slot, and and it was clear. It's about faith, and I opened the Bible to my notes, and, and here we are, and, and it encourages me because I, you know, just like any other person can feel inadequate at times and feel like possibly you're not getting it, and and I'm so thankful. And I did not, and, and this is to tell the listeners, I did not have um, your program on because I wanted to be hearing from the Lord. And um, I, and I didn't. So this is just a confirmation. But um, I'll go on and share a couple of other things, and then I'll, I'll get into the prophetic word. Um, let's see here what I've got written. That um, This is what, what God gave to me earlier, and I have marked. Here, my Bible was open. Everyone knows this uh, scripture most likely by heart, and it's Second uh, Chronicles, and it's seven verse fourteen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Such a great verse, such so powerful, so quoted and so used, and so ridiculously mishandled. This verse has four, it's not so simple as just to pray to God. Yes, through Jesus, we are able to speak to him. But this grace card that's played, the I always, personally, my and people who know me, I say this, I really believe the most misquoted scripture of the entire Bible is thou shalt not judge. It just drives me crazy because that is such a convenient card to play when someone doesn't like what they hear. And so it's always love, love, love. And it is. God is love. But the entire reason that we have grace was because there is judgment. And if we as parents can only give our children love, that's all we do is just love them. Of course we want to love them. But if there are no boundaries, if there's no teaching and consequences and balance to anything, then all they are is just a spoiled person that thinks completely of themselves. So there's this entire group, or I want to say just do a line in the middle of the Christian walk, and there's a whole group of people that say it's all about grace. And so look at this. There's four things that we're told to do. If my people who are called by my name, will, number one, humble themselves. Number two, pray. Number three, seek my face. Number four, turn from their wicked ways. Then, there's three things that God says. Then, number one, I will hear you. Number two, I will forgive their sin, and number three, I will heal their land. There is so much that we are truly to do in our walk as Christians. We have heavy responsibility. We are to be separate from this world. We are in it, but not of it. We are to be set apart. It's not so simple as raising our hands when they, they like the, the Muslims, the call to prayer. It's not so simple as saying, okay, God, I said my prayer before I went to bed. 
okay, God, I pray every day before I eat and every meal. We are to humble ourselves. And a scripture that I love um, in Psalm, let me put my Bible here, um, near the beginning of Psalm. But it's um, obedience is better than sacrifice. And it's a simple lesson that I teach. And I'm like, what, I tell, ask people, what does that mean? It means that it's much better to do what is right than to say you're sorry all the time. And so God is wanting us to be a holy people. He is calling us and calling us and calling us. And all of this nonsense and this, oh, everything's okay, we live by grace. No, we don't have to obey. No, we don't have to build an ark. No, I don't have to put food in there for my family. No, I don't have to expect all this to happen. I'm going to kick back because I believe in you, God, and that's all I've got to do. And I said my prayers. There's more. And that was what God um, laid in my heart to share in that about that scripture is it is so much more we need to humble ourselves. The Bible says that a, a sacrifice to God is a, um, a contrite heart, is that he wants the genuine apology. It's when we are on our faith and we are saying, God, I'm sorry, I was wrong, I messed up, I need you. That's number one, true humbleness. And for us to pray and to speak to him and to spend time with him. And I challenge people, don't do just a five-minute prayer or a ten-minute prayer. Go for the long prayers. And I don't want to talk about myself and how long I pray, but I can tell you it's amazing. And there's been physical studies that are done. You can look that up on YouTube um, and on the Internet of what happens to the brain um, when we pray longer. Number three in this assignment is to seek his faith. And we're told in Matthew 5, you know, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be open to you, which means there's a whole other level. It's not. It's for those that make the action part in our walk. And the fourth is to turn. We have to change. We can't just say, oh, I'm sorry, and yeah, I'm praying to you. We have to make a physical change in this physical world and a spiritual change and turn away from sin, clean up our lives, go away from the things that we're not to be doing. Then that's when he starts to hear us, and he'll forgive our sin and heal our land. And I want to share this thing. It's interesting. Um, our youngest girl called me this morning with three boys and three girls, grown children with six. And she had a dream last night. And it was a very, very interesting dream. So I called her um, just before I called in here um, and wrote it down, make sure I was, was remembering it correctly. <clears throat> and this was her dream last night. He doesn't know where the city was, but he said it was something like New York. It was a very large, major city. And she saw Jesus. But he was very, very tall, as tall as the skyscrapers. And he, she said he was wearing, like, Roman armor, but it was brilliant gold in the armor. And it was on him, and then he had the sash and everything, and the way he was dressed. And he was walking through the buildings, like the the roads, I don't think he's physically going through the building, but more in between them, I believe is what she was saying. And he was saying, I am your provider. I am your refuge. I am your strength. I am what you are seeking. I am here. This is what you have been missing. And it was like she knew that he was trying to tell people that he is here. He's available and to be to be warned and to know that this is the answer. And, and in a way, you know, she said it was a very long dream, but yet when she told it to me, it, it seems so simple. But I just wanted to share that because I believe that that will confirm something with another person. I've just, I've been getting a lot of messages today for who had dreams, and I have been having um, dreams as well. I have lots and lots of dreams, but I usually have not had end-time type dreams, but I've been having some of those. Um, in the last month, and I can tell you with this warning that I received and went out on True News that um, there is a huge judgment that's coming upon the church, and I am not um, abreast and as educated as some are on the world news um, of what's going on with settlements and war, but what I do know is that we as a church are going to go through this 
because of our laziness and our unwillingness to be a difference in this world. And um, I encourage those that are listening that have had the belief that everything is going to be fine. I actually thought of this right before it came to me. How often have we talked about Noah and his family having motion sickness? You know, I think I may actually write an article on that. But we think, oh, Noah was in the ark. Oh, he he did great. Well, you know, we never thought about were they sick at their stomach because of everything that was going on. They went through the storm. They survived it. They prepared for it. They obeyed, prayed, kept God first, and survived it completely through obedience, through faith. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and share the prophetic word, if that's all right with you. Yeah, amen. Is it okay? You want me to go ahead and go on? Yeah, amen. Praise God. Please do. Okay. All right. It's going to be long, so then you'll understand. And um, I always tell people that you'll, you know when it's God, when a person's voice changes. And you'll, you'll hear that with me as I get going with this because um, this is directly from the Lord. I received it on a Sunday morning at the end of August, and it didn't stop until Tuesday morning. It took me about 48 hours. And um, here we go. This portion is to the church. To the church. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Are you prepared for those who are coming? They are coming. They are coming. Many will come who understand and will repent. Many will come who do not understand and will need understanding. Are your plans in place? Be prepared for the harvest. Are your nets in place? You are a lighthouse. You are a beacon. You are a life raft. You are a life ring. You are a life jacket. You are a lighthouse in the storm. You are the beacon of light in the darkness. You are the life raft in the waves. You are the life jacket to the drowning. Where is my church? Where is your strength? Where is your light? The harvest is plentiful. Where are my workers? Where are my servants? I cry out for my harvest, but the workers are few. You are called to be the strength of the world, yet you do not even put out your nets. Where are my watchmen? Where are the workers of the wall? Where is your protection? I scream for my workers, but you are asleep during the watch. Awake and rise up, my church, for the time has come to take heed. The storm is coming. Do you see it? Where are the guardsmen guarding the wall? The guardsmen guard what is precious. The watchmen stand high to see what is coming so that those inside can prepare. Who is guarding your walls? Prepare, prepare, unify, and be strong. The time is here. To my people, are you ready? Are you prepared? Are you prepared for those who will be coming to your home who will need your help? Can you give answer to the hope you have within you? Where is my word? You come to my house claiming to be of me, yet you do not even know my word. You come into my house while my book gathers dust in yours. Week after week you come and you have not even picked up my book. You use a machine to give you pieces of my word. Where is my word? Where is my word? I look at your door frames and they are bare. I look at your gates, and they are bare. Where is my word? Where is my word? Read my word. Know my word. Hide it in your heart, because you will need it. You must know my word, for it will sustain you. Hide it in your heart. My word will sustain you in the darkness. I am a consuming fire. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. The words I give you today will be the same tomorrow. The words I gave the prophets of old are the same for you today. I am everlasting. I am a consuming fire. I am the God of truth. Come only with truth. You sing to me while your heart is hiding your sin. 
I want no secrets. I want nothing concealed. My people who are called by my name are a people of truth. Do not come to me with your feet. Do not come to me with your hand. Come to me with your lips. Come to me with your heart. You cannot come to me week after week with sin in your heart. I am all-knowing. Repent with truth. Speak the truth to me, for I already know it before the words come out of your mouth. Do you think you can fool the Lord God? Do you think you can claim to be of me while you hide parts of yourself? You cannot come to my throne on high without truth. Come to me with truth of who you are, and I will meet you there. Your God is holy. Do you not know that my son became the lamb, beaten, bloody, and died so that I can even hear you? You were redeemed for a high price, the price of his life. My only son redeemed you. Do not cheapen his price. Do not come with deceit. Do not come to me with excuse. Do not praise me if you have not confessed all truth to me. I probe your heart, and I want all of you. I search for my people who are of spirit. Why do you question obedience? Has the world corrupted your thinking that you can question the Lord God on high? Before my death angel came, my people were told to place blood over their door frames. They obeyed without question. It was their obedience that saved them. My son Noah obeyed without question. For the sake of his grandfather, I delayed 800 years and hoped to find more worthy. In my anger, in my despair, in my rage against an evil world, I brought calamity to it. It was through obedience Noah and his family were saved. Noah and his family covered their ears for the noise was deafening. My servant Joseph and his entire family were saved from the great famine. My people were saved by obedience without question. Be obedient to my words. Be truthful to me. I detest a lying tongue and a lying heart. Bear your soul to me, and I will give you rest. Bear your heart to me, and I will claim you. Obey my warning. Obey my instruction without question. It will save you and your family. <clears throat> Guard your children. Do not let anyone who is not of me around your children. The world is evil. Trust not the world with your children. You are of royal priesthood. My people are a holy nation. Your children wear royalty because they are pure. Prize your offspring. They are pure. Cover their ears from the corruption of this world. Cover their minds or the world will take them from you. The world is coming. They are rattling the doors, shaking them like in the days of Lot. Are your doors fastened? Are you inside with provisions like Noah? Are you unshakable, pure, holy, and true to me, without withstanding against the world? Where are the men? Where is the strength of my people? Does not a thief come in and tie the strong man so that he can mob the whole house? Are there any strong men left who can protect my people? Men, rise up. I want men of strength and of truth. Noah was the refuge to the people, yet he saved his family. The storm is coming. I am warning my people. Do you hear the sound of the threshing floor? Will you fall between the cracks like the tares? I claim only a people of truth. I claim only a church found spotless and holy. Prepare, prepare. Repent now before it is too late. The day of Noah was much repenting. But my face had already turned. The day of Lot was wailing and sorrow, but my face was already turned. Do not wait until disaster to think of me in your heart. Do not wait for the deafening noise to call out my name. Come now. Come now to me with your wailing. Confess to me. Come to me with a pure heart, with lips that speak truth at my throne. Be warned. Be warned. I will claim. Only a people of holiness, undaunted, untainted, unchanged, and unmoved. I am your rock. I am forevermore. I am the everlasting God. You 
still there? <laughs> yeah, I love it. Praise Jesus. Here, that that word, that word. Uh, you can ask anybody who's a listener of this radio show, radio show, who's a regular listener of this program. What Kenneth and I have been preaching now consistently for like the last two years is almost to a T what you what what the Lord spoke through you uh, in in that admonishment. Um, uh, that that's on the spot. It's absolutely perfect word from the throne room of God. Hallelujah. Amen. The consistent theme is holiness. And if for those that have that. I know there's some listeners that um, are connected to me um, have been reading my articles and different things that I've been doing. And as it's sort of led up to this word I received, but a consistent web and theme through my writings has been holiness, raising the bar. It's you know what? Wake up. You, I, you know. You know what's amazing, Kim, mm-hmm. is that I I came from a once saved, always saved background from a, a kind of a Pentecostal charismatic background in the 70s. And I backslid and thought I had a Willy Wonka golden ticket into the narrow gate my whole life. My, I still have family members who are spirit-filled and speak in tongues and everything, and they still think, they still believe in once saved, always saved, which is a lie from the devil. Uh, mm-hmm. But anyway, the, the, where I'm heading with this is when the fear of God came upon me when I realized through a series of events and some chastening that I needed to get serious with the Lord and that I was heading straight to hell on a six-lane freeway. And I started to go into the Bible fearing God, but also loving Him and being awed by Him. I thought to myself, wow, the whole New Testament, chapter after book after chapter after chapter after book, is admonishing the believers over and over and over again to practice righteousness and holiness or else, or else. As you had pointed out, as you had pointed out in your word earlier, especially in the first part, very first part, and this is something we talk about frequently, is that there are no promises in the Bible that do not have requirements associated with them. We are required to be obedient. We are required to be compliant with the Scripture. We are required to overcome the temptation uh, uh, of sin in our lives. We are required to hold every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. These are not optional. And you're right. The church, by and large, the majority of the church, by and large, holds up the grace flag and says... Here's my here's my passport to sin freely. Jesus paid the price. I don't have to worry about a thing. All have uh, fallen short and, and and you know of the glory of God. All have sinned and, and come short of the glory of God. They take the, the the verse that they quote completely out of context and relieve themselves of all responsibility to be obedient and to recognize the significance of the sacrifice of Jesus. Mm-hmm. The ultimate mm-hmm. slap in the face to the heavenly to our heavenly Father. It's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. I want to share this thought before I um, go to the, the the last portion of the prophetic word. Um, this is where what God has put on me in the last couple of months, maybe about the last six weeks or so, eight weeks, is that God, you know, if you think about the scripture that, that Jesus is coming for his bride, he doesn't say brides, that it's not plural, it's one. That we have got to, and this is at the end of the prophetic word um, to the church at the beginning, at the very end it says, you know, unify and become strong. That um, what God has called me to do is to, and and that's why it's called One True Church, that's the website, the number one true church dot org. And I changed, took my name off the website, changed it to that. And because I know that when the persecution starts, and it already is starting, we're we're sort of in in mild persecution right now, and not really quite to medium or heavy just yet here in the United States, but that we're going, it's not going to be, you know, when do you take communion, Uh, what what do you, you know, do you speak in tongues, not in tongues, which version of the Bible do you use, we're going to, we're going to be, all of that man-made type discussion and doctrine is going to be over to the side because we're going to become unified with the true church. 
Um, Mm -hmm. It's not going to be about denominations at all. But one of the things that um, is pushing hard on, on me to tell people is that, you know, if you think about, um, and, and I share this question a lot, uh, I hold a picture up of um, some of the Jews in the concentration camps, and I say, what killed them? And I, I do this at different events. And, of course, you'll, you'll, you'll hit, you'll, they'll say Hitler. No, that's who killed them. Um, the gas chambers, no, that's how they died. What killed them? And I hold different pictures up, the very skinny, almost dead, you know, in, in their outfits, um, different barbed wire shots. And what killed them? Okay, and then I show the picture of last year, one of the first shots of what ISIS was doing, the, the men in the orange suits at the ocean. And I said, what killed them? And held it up. And then eventually somebody gets it. And what killed them, because what happened with the Jewish people, all they had to do was say they weren't Jewish. That's all they had to do. They, but they didn't. It was their identity that killed them. And I you know, held up the picture of the men in the orange suits. So. All they had to do was say they weren't a Christian. It was their identity that killed them. And I said, you must know, and I'm going to say this to those that are listening, you must know your identity. Because when the persecution comes and you don't know who you are, you are not going to make it. You're going to be the ones in the scripture that says many will fall away, many will give up the faith, because you don't know who you are. You must know that you are a holy people of royal priesthood, a holy nation. We are not of this world. And just like I share with this about fasting, if you meet with someone and you say, well, you know, are you going to go on the fast? Well, I'll see how I'm doing. I'll see how I feel. And I always laugh and say, well, you're going to have a headache. It's not about that. You have to know ahead of time. You have to be prepared. I'm going to fast X amount of days. I'm going to do it this way. Because if you do it on how you feel, come 9, 30, or 10, you're going to have a headache. And you're going to think, wow, this is hard. I've got to eat. So uh, this is this is the bulk of what I say on this topic. It's this. Know your identity, and you have the talk with your family and your children of how you're going to handle it. Know it ahead of time. There is no way that you are going to know what to do, your family is going to know how to handle it if you have not discussed it. And one of the things back, um, and I shared this on the True News interview, and I'll share this here, but back um, in the 50s, back when in China, when Christianity uh, became illegal and everything became underground and they were going to kill all of the Christians, they expected to snuff out the church. They, that was it. They you know, Bibles were burned. They were, nobody was allowed to have them. But what happened is the church exploded, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew. Amen. So uh, just a few years back, um, there were some studies that were done about this. And they wanted to find out what happened, because you would think that the church would have been snuffed out and it was gone because they were persecuted. So they found some of the um, older pastors that were still living and um, different people that were children at the time and anyone that was still living that had gone through all of that to find out what what was the secret, what was it, what made it grow. And they found a consistent answer, a consistent theme, and it was this. The church prepared them for the persecution. So this is my question that I'm saying to a lot of people that are listening. Where is the plan We can fill up the radio stations, and we can have YouTube videos, and we can be on Facebook, and we can talk all day long of all the signs and the moon and the stars and the star of Bethlehem, and we can talk about the wars and Russia and and nukes and, and ISIS, and we can just keep going. And that's all information. But my question is, what is your plan of how you as a church you as a family are going to make it. Have role play. I'm not kidding. If you right now, if somebody came in and burst through your door or through one of your windows and had one of, I don't know, the big guns, M16s or whatever they're called, a big gun, and obviously a very powerful gun, what are you going to do? Do you know that I've told my children, whatever is done to me, don't give in. 
I've had the talk with them. Have the talk. Because, you see, what's going to happen is a lot of people think, I'm strong. I can take it. But what they do is they don't take the strong as an example. They bait the weak because they want you to give in. So they'll take a child. They'll take someone that you dearly love. And that's what they did, what, just back in August or September with those missionaries and the 12-year-old boy. And they took the boy. See, of course, they knew the father being one of the missionaries. They took the boy right in front and, you know, asking different questions. And the father said no. And they'd whack the finger off of the boy. And the boy was screaming, Dad, don't give in. Don't give in. And they cut all the fingers off of the boy. Eventually, they put them all on the cross. And and they were all killed. They were alive when it happened. But and, And it's gruesome. And it's not pleasant. But let me tell you. Six million Jews died because they knew who they were. They could have given in. They could have said something else, but they knew their identity. All of these different Christians that are being um, beheaded and on and on the story is going, they know their identity. There's something within them that they're willing to die for. Are you that strong and have you had those conversations and have you been before God humbling yourself, seeking his faith? repenting and turning from your wicked ways so that you know that God has heard from you up in heaven and he has forgiven you and he's with you. And I saw something just a couple of days ago um, on an article, and I, I ended up reading some more about it. But Sophie Scholl was age 22, and there was a recent anniversary of her execution. She was a German woman who was executed by the Nazis for distributing anti-Nazi pamphlets. And the prison officials later in describing the scene when she was hung, they could not believe the courage. Now, this is a 22-year-old young woman who had just been putting material out. And her last words were, how can we expect righteousness to prevail when there is hardly anyone willing to offer themselves up individually for a righteous cause. Such a fine, sunny day, and I have to go. And they hung her, age 22. And one one of the p- people that I love to study about is John Tyndale. And, you know, people that way, way back, this was back in the 1500s, he spoke eight languages. He translated a good portion of the Bible and was the one that went over to Germany and printed the Bible. And was, he was burned at the stake because that was decreed by Henry VIII, that you couldn't have a Bible in your own home. It all goes back to the story of the the Catholic Church, and they had control, and they they were the ones that got to tell what people, you know, people, what God's word was, and, of course, he was going against that. So what happened is they burned him at the stake. But his last words, and I wrote this down to make sure I got the quote correct. Just before he died, Tyndale said out loud, God opened the eyes of Henry, King Henry VIII, thereby allowing people in England to have access to their own Bibles. Three, now, he died for this cause. Three years later, it was decreed that every man, every home could have a Bible. Of course, now we have them all over. So I'm just leading to say this. You better know who you are. You better know your identity. That's what it's going to be all about. The sheep and the goats are going to get separated. It's already started. The gap is starting to happen already. You gotta know it. The pressure's coming. It's all gonna be in subtle ways. What's gonna, here's a subtle one. Here we go. You're at work. And you're given a form. And you have to sign it. And it says, you're not gonna bring your Bible, and you're not, well, let's just make it more subtle. You're not gonna discuss religion. We're just gonna stay generic, and we just don't wanna have problems here. And you'll sit there and say, you know, it's true. I, you know, I go to my Bible studies, and we discuss God's Word at church, and, and I even have a Bible study in my home, and, you know, it's okay, because that way there's just no conflict here at work. And you bend over the table, pick up the pen, and you sign your name. That's how it starts. It's very subtle. The one inch gains the mile. Know who you are. But see, especially men, their identity is tied into their jobs, and they don't want to not have provision for their families. So, well, you know, I won't make waves. It's okay. Well, then next will be your Bibles and so things right away. It's all going to be little, bitty, subtle changes. Know your identity. Know who you trust. Know that regardless of not having a job, that you will be provided for 
that's what faith is. Do you have any thoughts before I share the rest of the prophetic word? Well, <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm not saying this to be boastful. I'm just saying it because I believe that it is where we all need to go. It's where we, I, I'm, you know, I, I would be a hypocrite if I didn't set the example and, and live the way, you know, physician Neil died self, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I have on my Facebook page a picture of the back of my car. I have an SUV, and there are giant letters that spell the name of Jesus across it. It's a black SUV, and the letters are white. It says Jesus, Mm -hmm. and underneath it has a tagline. It says, find something that you would die for and live for it. Now, you would think think that people would be negative about it. In fact, it's the opposite. People are beeping their horns at me. I was in a parking lot loading my car with groceries from the store. Praise Jesus. I thank you, Father, for your blessing. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. a group of teenagers went walking by, and they're like, Jesus, he is the one. People are enthusiastic. People are motivated. I have on the outside of my house a large flag. I'm surrounded by homes that have American flags flying. I have a large purple flag with the gold letters Jesus on it. I had a a Jehovah's Witness come up and and say to him, wow, he's standing in the front of my house, a Jehovah's Witness, and he's standing there with his Bible in his hand, and he's like, wow, a Jesus flag. You know what? The way I see it is I don't want to be here. But if I, just like the Apostle Paul did in Philippians chapter 1, verse 19, 20, 21, et cetera, you know, I don't want to be here, but I got a job to do. Uh, I would much rather be with the Lord Jesus. I would much rather be in, in heaven, but we got a job to do. And you know what? Mm-hmm. I'm I'm standing on the faith of the Holy uh, on the Bible, and and if, and and I believe every single word of the Scripture. The Scripture says that not one sparrow falls to the ground outside of the Father's will. Mm-hmm. I know that the Father brought down the iron yoke of Babylon upon the Jews uh, during the Babylonian captivity. That was part of His judgment. I know that the darkness that's going to roll across this country is going to be part of His judgment, and I know that we are going, going to all have to become Daniels. We are all going to have to become our own version of Daniels amidst uh, our own captivity in the, in this country as the judgments yes. roll across it. And you know what? At the end of the day, I don't care because he who seeks to save his life will lose it. When Jesus yes. said, he who seeks to save his life will lose it, what he meant, when Jesus talks about life, he's always talking about eternal life or, etern- or, or, or eternal damnation. So you've got to understand spiritually what he's really saying. When Jesus says, he who seeks to save his life will lose it, he really means he who seeks to save his life will end up in hell. And he who seeks, he, he who's willing to lay down his life for my mm-hmm. sake will we'll find it. it. Amen. Mm-hmm. This is about heaven and hell, folks, and nothing should be standing in our way of making it to heaven and accepting the eternal gift of glory that Jesus died on that cross to give each and every one of us. This earth means nothing. This is but a vapor. It's all going to pass away, and you are absolutely right, Kim. You nailed it when you said we need to help our children understand the gravity of the situation, to see this through godly, heavenly eyes, and to be willing and glorified and happy to allow Whatever will be, will be the will of God in our lives and, and, and spiritually, through spiritual, because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds mm-hmm. and every high thing mm-hmm. that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, um, you know, Second Corinthians 10, 5, 4 and 5. Mm-hmm. The point being that spiritually we got to stand, we got to fight against the forces of darkness. If we're, if, if. Okay, because we should be able to pray for a hedge of protection if you are living in the fear of God and practicing righteousness and holiness. It should be possible to get a hedge of protection, but it may be a little other that you suffer. And if you do suffer, so what? Praise Jesus. Let it come. Pray that the pain will be taken away. Pray that the ministering angels will come down like they did for Stephen, part the firmament, and let you see the Father and the Son on the throne, and go home to Jesus. And that's okay, because we're not from here, and we're not staying here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That was good. This is what, through this prophetic word, that was very clear given to me, and it's this. The church... Because of what, and I'm going to share this last part here in just a second, because of what's been happening in the churches, that we are going through it. 
Absolutely. Now, I believe that me and my family, or maybe I can only speak for myself, but I, I'm including my family, that we're going to be okay. But the only reason we are okay is because I and we have chosen to be obedient and have chosen to prepare. We have chosen to spend time on our knees. We are very much aware of the holy walk that we are to do. There's a lot involved in my knowledge of knowing we're going to be okay. So that's back to Noah. No one knew he was going to be okay, but he had to do those things he was told to do in order for him to be okay. It was not an easy year for him. We, you know, I'm going to, I really will. I'm going to write an article about was Noah and his family, did they have motion sickness, you know? And, you know, they, they rocked and rocked in that boat and they were in the rain and the darkness and the noise and with animals and they had all that food stored and they were in, well, somewhat cramped quarters, but at least isolated quarters. And we, we kind of forget that part of the story. And they walked out, and they were fine, and they were okay. But it was because of their obedience. And back to the death angel. And, you know, they could have said, you know what, we need to have an elders meeting. You know what, I, I'm going to pray about that. Let me just see if that's somewhere in the scriptures. Let's see if that's somewhere in the word. You know, instead they were immediately, they chose obedience, and it saved them. So I can only say to those that are listening, I'm telling you, if you've walked all these years as a Christian, praise God. Praise God in your faith. But I'm telling you, we are going through a storm, and it's coming. It could be tomorrow. It could be tonight. We still could be a few months out. Who knows? It could be a year. That poor sin God has not told me, but he has clearly told me and warning and warning the church. And if you read the scriptures, one thing is that God gives warnings because he wants to give mercy. He's telling us the judgment is coming. First, it's the judgment on the church here, and um, and after that, then then praise God, we're going to be with him. But let me go ahead and share with you this part to those who stand in the pulpit. Is that okay? Yeah, amen. Okay, amen. Okay, so the first part was to the church. The second part was to my people. And here we go, to those who stand in my pulpit. This is very serious. This is going to let you know the extent of what um, God has had enough. Here we go. To those who stand in my pulpit. To those who stand in my pulpit, I see you from afar. Where you stand to represent me is holy. Where you stand to send forth my word is holy. I watch you as you take position in my holy church and open your mouth as my vessel. The Lord God rebukes you for your approach to my pulpit. You come with words with unprepared hearts. You come with unprepared hearts from unprepared worship. You come with unprepared worship from unprepared prayer closet. Your closet is unprepared because I am not the Lord of your life. Your lust for position, your lust for status, your lust for recognition, your lust for praise, your lust for authority, your lust for possessions, your lust of self, your lust for eloquent words, your lust for beauty, your lust for money, your lust for decorated homes, your lust for property, your lust to be showcased before men, your lust of your eyes, your lust for favoritism which overshadows my Holy Spirit, your lust for pictures which you call pornography is a scent to my nostrils. I search for the aroma for the holy ones who stand to send forth teaching to my people. I find you who have prepared hearts, prepared worship, and prepared prayer closets. I find you who lust only for me. Do you think you can pass through my threshing floor without me catching you? Do you think you can fool the Lord God Almighty? I am sifting and shaking the very foundations of the earth, and the only truth will remain. Only the truth will I know by name. Woe to the one who screams to me, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and perform miracles? But will be told, I never knew you. Do you think you deserve more than my beloved son? You place the yoke of teaching for material possessions as a sign of spiritual favor. My son, my holy son of me, had no place for his head. He saw the hoofs and legs of horses as he slept in a horse stable. 
wrapped in cloth, his bed was a feed manger for the horses. He traveled and experienced the elements of this world without shelter. He died on a cut tree and was buried in a borrowed tomb. Do you think you deserve more than my own? Do you think I did not love and provide for my own? His life was not of the physical, but of my spirit. He lived among you with ownership to my kingdom, without earthly possessions. My favor is not the world's definition of favor. My favor is not in man's possessions. My favor is evident within a man's heart that gives all to serve me. Do not be deceived. The adversary has fooled you to believe my hand is upon those with possessions. My son served both God and man without possessions. Shame is upon you for claiming knowledge of me while teaching this message. Shame is upon you for living luxuriously while claiming to be my servant. Do you think you deserve more than my son? Rent and rake your heart before me. If you repent before me now, I will not remove you. Seek me while I'm able to be found. For a time is coming, I will raise high the false teachers for all to see and break them before the people. Humble yourself now so that I will not hold you in shame before men. My pulpit is holy. Step not upon my altar. Step not into position before the people with an unprepared heart, with unprepared worship, and unprepared prayer. I warn you this day, I will hold all false teachers high before the people as an example of foolishness. I warn you this day, I will clear my threshing floor of the chaff who has been made mere waste. I will warn you this day to remove yourself from the position you claim falsely is yours. My pulpit is holy. My words are holy. My teaching is holy. My servant, my servants whom I recognize are holy. Remove the yoke of possession. Remove the yoke of the world from your neck and be the one called from long ago. Remember the quickening of your heart when you received the burning in your heart to serve me. I am a jealous God. Those who stand in my pulpit must love me first. Those who stand in my pulpit must speak my words. Those who stand in my pulpit must please me and not man. I will guide you. Seek me and I will protect you. Seek man and you will not withstand the fire. Seek me and I will guide your steps. Seek man and you will be discarded as dross. I am a consuming fire. I am a holy God. I claim only a holy people. I am coming with a swift hand to clean my pulpit. Repent now. Go to another for counsel to cleanse the impurity from you. Go to another, the one you have jealousy of. Go for counsel. For it was not jealousy you had. It was your spirit knowing them as true to me. You will find rest in their counsel and freedom for your soul, which you have bound in evil. You have stood in my holy pulpit with evil inside you. The great remnant was torn to the holy of holy so that man could enter inside. You have not kept it holy. Free yourself now before it is too late, and I remove you publicly. You have built stages in my holy church. You have built restaurants in my holy church. You have built stores inside my holy church. You have allowed buying and selling inside my holy church. You parade people speakers at events with tables for buying and selling inside my holy church. You have made convenience for the world as a lure to bring them into my holy church. You lure them with convenience because you desire money instead of their heart. You allow the young to ask for money, raise money, and collect money inside my holy church. Is it not written, son, removed the money changers with a whip? You have allowed your youth to act like the world. You have built stages with lights and music to appear appealing as the world. Even your leaders talk and dress like the world. What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Why do you make my holy church common for the unbeliever? I hold you accountable for allowing this inside my holy church. Guard my pulpit. Remove earthly pleasures from my pulpit. Remove entertainment from my pulpit. My pulpit is not for pleasure. My pulpit is not for performance. My pulpit is not for announcements or discussion. My pulpit is holy. Approach my pulpit with a prepared heart, with prepared worship and prepared prayer. 
Only then will I hear you, and you will hear from me. My word is holy. My word is a double-edged sword to quicken even the most hardened heart. The time is here. The people need my word. Teach my word. Remove man's conditions of my pulpit. Remove man's tradition of time, of comfort, and of soothing the ear. Make my pulpit a fire for the people to hear the word of your mighty God. I am coming soon to claim a holy people and a holy church. Cast not your eyes away from my word. Cast not your heart to another and claim to be my messenger. I am a consuming fire. Only those with true obedience to these words will withstand the heat I am sending. Follow me and not man. Listen to me and you will hear me. I am raising up a new church, the true church. I am destroying the false church of man. It will not withstand my judgment. Prepare now. Prepare the people. Listen to me and not to man. Discard every tradition you have lived and place it in your fire, and I will give you a boldness to carry my message to the people. Listen only to me, and I will guide you. Obey these instructions. Carry not, for your time is short to repent privately to me. I will no longer accept weak need messengers in my pulpit. Praise God. I love that. Hallelujah. I tell people all the time, Ephesians 2.11, uh, 2, 2.11 2, through 18 uh, basically says that, you know, we, the Gentiles, are spiritual Israel. Uh, you know, it says in two, uh, Ephesians 2, verse 14, for he himself is our peace, it's Jesus, who has made both one, Jew and Gentile, both one, mm-hmm. Jew and Gentile. And has broken mm-hmm. down the middle wall of separation, having abolished the, you know, in his flesh the enmity. All right, now listen, check it out. Now, what does that mean? What's the implication of that? When you go back and you look at spirit, spiritually read the Old Testament, when when a rabbi in Israel reads the Song of Solomon, he thinks he's reading about a man and a woman. Mm-hmm. That's incorrect. It's about the bride. Of Jesus Christ, but right. they can't see that because they haven't advanced to the understanding of Ephesians 2:11, where through Christ we are all made. So that means that when you read the rebuke of the irresponsible shepherds in Ezekiel 34, that is applicable to today's church. Mm-hmm. So it's fascinating what you just said, uh, you know, through through that Rama word. Is, is, is a repeat, really, of, of – and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll just read one paragraph from it. Listen to this. And the word – this is Ezekiel 34. This is applicable to today's church. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, which we are, because we are made both into one. Mm-hmm. Prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should Mm -hmm. not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourself with the wool. You slaughter Mm -hmm. the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have Mm -hmm. not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up or broken, nor brought back that which was driven away, nor sought that which was lost. But with force and cruelty you have ruled over them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. They became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. These are people leaving the church because they're dismayed. My sheep wandered through the mountains on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them. This judgment is talking about the shepherds of the churches of today feeding themselves with the tithes and the offerings, but not feeding the sheep, and ultimately offering them up to the devil. Mm -hmm. And that's what Mm -hmm. we have today. This is horrific, but very true and and a powerful message that we need to get out to people. I feel sorry. I've known a lot of really good-hearted people behind the pulpit who don't, who've who been sucked into the vortex of theology and actually believe they're doing a, a good thing. And I just cannot understand because they don't behave, they don't preach like they're reading the same Bible I'm reading. Yes. It's amazing. 
And and I've told many people to to be prepared for a great deal of what we believed to be leaders that will be falling away because we're told that in the scriptures. And as the pressure is coming, and, and one of the, the scriptures that, that I like, really like, it's in Matthew, and it's real simple, but a lot of people say, oh, wide is the road of destruction, you know, narrow is the road to righteousness, or however you want to say it. But there's a second part to this, third, third part, it's, and small is the gate. So as we go further, it gets smaller and smaller. And we have a farm, and so I use this illustration a lot with our different gates and um, different rooms and the barns even, is we have certain gates that, of course, the bigger animals cannot get through. And then, but the next size animal can. And then we'll have another gate or another area, and the next size animal can make it through. And then we, you know, then we have even, like, start out with the cows, and then we have calves, and then we have some goats, and we have some baby goats, or we have pigs, and then we have little baby pigs. So smaller and smaller they get. And then we even have a gate, and we kind of joke about it because the way we hung it is some of the smaller goats can literally crawl on their bellies and go under it, and they're able to get through. And I think about that scripture here is, you know, we say, oh, well, wide is the road. You know, get on the narrow path. You know, choose God. Well, it, it goes further. And it, it, it just think of like a siphoning, and, and we're getting smaller and smaller. And it takes more and more effort, more and more focus, more and more choice. And the group's going to get smaller and smaller. And we're going to, you know, small is the gate we've got to crawl under. And then next, what's the next thing that we have to do? And the group is going to get smaller as we go. And there's going to be a lot of difficulties. I know this, but with our faith, and if we stay strong in the word, stay rooted, know our identity, be prepared, be obedient in our faith, don't just wait, you know, oh, everything's going to be okay, you know, I'm just going to ride along, you know, everything's going to be fine, well, there's going to be a heck of a storm coming, and if you're not prepared, and you don't have provisions, and you're not set up, and you're not awake, and you're not watching for him to come, and you don't have your oil, and you don't have your lamps lit, and you don't have your table prepared, on and on and on and on and on we go. It's not just sitting on the doorstep and saying, praise Jesus. Of course, we do want to praise God, but like you said, there is, it's a simple phrase I use, there is responsibility in our Christianity, period. And I'll share this last part before we wrap up here. Uh, but this is the fourth part. Usually it's all – and also you could go to my YouTube channel. It's under my name, Kim Hilton, K-I-M Hilton, H-I-L-T-O-N. And um, these are there in different pieces that you can click on. And this is the last one, to those who claim to be in my ministry. So, first of all, it's to the church. You know, Where are you? Are you prepared? Are you ready? Second part, to my people. What are you doing? You're not even reading the word. Are you being obedient? The, the third portion is specifically to those who stand in the pulpit. And then the last, which I really like this one, because I can name a lot of people in this, to those who claim to be in my ministry. Oh, amen. You, <laughs> this one is I'm crazy. I'm amening it because you know why? I get <laughs> emails from people all over the world sending me YouTube video after YouTube video after one person after another who's telling everybody that they're an evangelist. They're now working for the Lord. They're doing this. They're doing that. And I'm listening. I hear what they say. I'm like, do they even read the Bible? Do they even realize that James warned us and said, I would not want for many of you to become teachers because don't you know that we will receive a stricter judgment? And they're out there. Mm-hmm. They, they have crossed the line, and they don't realize the ramifications of what they're doing and saying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Amen. To those who claim to be in my ministry, you claim to be of me, but I cannot hear you. I have called but you have not been, I, excuse me, let me start over. You claim to be of me, but I cannot hear you. I have called, but I have not chosen you. You seek the title of ministry, but you do not know service. You seek recognition, but you do not know sacrifice. The price is high to be in my office. I look for brokenness, but I see open pride. I am shaking the ranks to find the ones who understand you must come completely before me exposed. The shaking under your feet will reveal to all the difference between the called worker and the chosen officer. I am the potter, and it is I who chooses the noble and the common. The shifting beneath the man-made foundations will offend many, but will comfort the chosen. I am all-knowing, and I will reveal my plan through my chosen. 
Humble yourself quietly before me, for the one who exalts himself before men shall be removed. I love that. I want to share. It's it's good. I want to share with you something that um, the Lord just gave to me as um, we're finishing up here. Matthew 10. (laughs) This passage is unbelievably powerful. He is telling the 12 apostles. He's getting them ready to go out. And this is what he tells them. This is what I want you to say. The kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is at hand. I want you to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, and drive out demons. Freely if you receive, freely give. Number one, do not take with you any gold or silver. That means take no money. Number two, take no bag for your journey. Can't take a suitcase. Can't take an extra tunic. No sandals. That means no extra shoes, no staff for the walking, or we could say no vehicle. For the worker, is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search for the worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter their home, give them your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest upon them. If not, take your peace with you. If anyone will welcome you and listen to you, or will not, then shake the dust off your feet when you leave. I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. And here it goes. Now imagine, this is really our assignment. I say this in my classes. This is our assignment. What are we supposed to say? The kingdom of God is coming. It's near. Say it, say it, say it. That's what John the Baptist did. He was saying. That's our assignment. But here we go. We're not supposed to take anything with us. We're not supposed to go around asking for money. We're not supposed to take all our fancy clothes. And this is it. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You're going to be handed over to local council and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you're going to be brought before governors and kings as witnesses. So when they arrest you, don't worry about what to say. At that time, you'll be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, it'll be the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death. And father, his child, and children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And I have the word stand circled because it's the same word in Ephesians 6 with the armor of God. When you've done everything you can and all the pushing and shoving in the wind, you're still standing. When When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. This is how hard. This is why people don't want to do it. It, it's a, you, you have to pay a price. Are you willing to go and be in the concentration camps because you're Jewish? Are you willing to go and be told you're Christians? Are you willing to have something sewn on your sleeve because of your identity? Are you willing to have nothing because of your identity? Oh, wait a minute. You know, I didn't know it meant we had to be hungry. Well, I mean, I have to have a job. Okay, what, what do you mean? Well, I, mean, I don't want to make waves. Know who you are, because that's what we're being called to do. Jesus stood here with the 12 that he had day in and day out with him, that he trained, and they did miracles, and he saw it. And he said, okay, guys, it's time. Don't take anything with you. And, oh, by the way, you're going to get beat. You're going to get flogged. You're going to uh, be die as martyrs, but you'll be okay. Do we really know that that's the commitment that we're being asked for This is the warning that God is saying, church, who are you? Do you even know who you are? Do you even know, do your children, why is it that that the Jewish children, they have such a sense of identity? Why would they let themselves starve like that and not once say, oh, I'm not Jewish? They knew who they were. We have got to get serious, church. We've got to wake up in America. The persecution has started. The storm is coming. Get yourself ready, hunker down, and you've got to get right for the, with the Lord because that's the only thing that's going to sustain you is your faith through obedience, period. Um, hey, man, I'm like, you know what, the, the whole thing for me, you know, and, and I don't know, I'm not saying this is for everybody, but you know what, for me, it's like I'm dead already. What is The only thing that's left is death and taxes, death 
and taxes. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Uh, you know, mm-hmm. at, at the end of the day, we're all going to die anyhow. But you know what? We're not because it's you know it's eternal life. You know, our, this life on this earth, no matter how wonderful or ugly or whatever it is, if you were to take a rope, as Francis Chan says. A rope yeah, I was just thinking that. Just two miles, I was going to say that. Two miles in front of you. Amen. Take a rope, stretch it two miles in front of you, as far as the eye can see, and you put a tiny little red dot on the end of that rope. And that tiny little red dot is who you are, your entire life, your family, your friends, your children, it's everything. That little bitty red dot. And that's what it all comes down to. He who seeks to, to save his life will lose it, and he mm-hmm. who loses his life for my okay. sake will find it. Be ready. I'm ready to die now. You know, if they came to my door, I'd be like, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. It's time to go home. Praise God. You know what? It, I, who cares? None of this stuff matters. Glory to Jesus. Let's. And, and I love, I think the number one most important thing amongst everything else that you said tonight, Kim, was prepare your family. Because when you read the Fox's Book of Martyrs, when you read the stories of the people who went through times as difficult as the times that we're probably going to be subjected to ourselves, you get a sense of unity. There's even one story in the Fox's Book of Martyrs where one person renounced Jesus and a young girl, I believe I have this right, a young girl in her teens yelled over to him, don't do it, don't sell your entire eternity for you know, she was actually, and then she ended up getting killed. The, the point is, we have to know who we are. We, we're we not from here. We're not staying here. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. We're being raised up for all of eternity. We have to see how big this is. And it makes all this other stuff seem so unimportant. And it really is. It's unimportant. Praise God. Would you close with a prayer for us tonight? We're down to two minutes. Yes. Dear God, I cover you covered in your son's blood in Jesus' name, and I praise you in your holy hallelujah. I thank you, God, for this appointment this evening. I pray, God, for even if it's just one person that received a piece, a word, for this entire message that changed the course of their path, and help us to know God that there are people following us, that our shadow touches other people, whether it's our children, our neighbors, or someone that we just may encounter. God, help us to know our identity. But we have to know, God, it has a price. We have to know that that's what is faith. Faith is real when we're willing to die for it. Forgive us for being comfortable. Forgive us for being foolish. Help us to understand this is what it's about. Help us, God to not give in. Help us to not be the ones in Scripture that gave up. Help us to be the ones that we know that we have died for you and did it with honor for you, not sobbing and not wimping and not complaining and why us. We know why us, God, because your son did it first. We know, God, that those that followed him and everything that we read in your word is about those who gave it all up. Help us to be prepared to give it all even our bodies, but they cannot take our souls. Thank you, God, again, and I praise you for your word and the power of your prophetic word. Be with the prophets and those that are hearing from you. Guide them. Guide us to discern, because the bottom line, God, is just to be ready. Get our oil and our our lamps lit and make us be watching, because we know you're coming. We know you're coming. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. Be ye doers of the word, not just hearers of the word, deceiving yourselves. James 122. Praise God. Get the word out to people. Help people to prepare spiritually for the things that are coming upon us. These are the greatest times. Millions of people, I would argue millions of people over the last 2,000 years gave their lives and wished that they could be those who we are chosen before the foundations of the earth for a time such as this. Glory be to the name of the Lord God. The kingdom of God is at hand. Hallelujah. Thank you, Sister Kim, for joining us tonight. Thank Thank you so much. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.